Okay. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us um, to this webinar uh, brought to you by uh, Breakaway Funding. Uh, my name is Dr. Lauren Souza. Today we're going to talk about global and local economic update and a forecast. Uh, based on my research, uh, I am forecasting a mild correction by 2018 and a recession by 2021 through 23. Based on the research, you have to start putting together your strategic, tactical, and operating plans in anticipation of those two corrections. And what I'm going to go through today is basically the data and the theory that's going to lay those out. And then I'll be making recommendations on what type of investment and risk management strategies you should be putting in place in anticipation of these events. Uh, obviously, the theme here is uh, breakout, breakaway, ride the wave, uh, recessions and corrective uh, uh, environments, particularly uh, uncertain economic environments are like riding big waves. You have to be an expert at, at riding these waves. It takes skill, it takes planning, and if you can um, plan and be in shape, you will be able to catch not only one wave, uh, but also multiple big waves. Uh, we're going to go over quickly just the overall global economic environment. Uh, Argentina is in a recession, Brazil is in a recession, Europe is slowing, China is slowing significantly, uh, Japan is in a recession, the U.S. is slowing uh, significantly, although the, uh, the employment markets are holding up. So basically the world is in recession or falling into recession, and the United States seems to be holding up fairly well, although our economy is slowing also. So we're at a very, very fragile state um, right now. The key economic indicators you want to look at is gross domestic product, industrial production, interest rates, employment, and I like to look at the stock market, the bond market, gold, uh, currency, and commercial real estate. Your market and your investment strategies and your risk management strategies can take advantage, can be taken advantage of by looking at employment trends, technology trends, manufacturing, trade, real estate, and then market performance. I like to lead with this. I wrote this in 1996. Uh, efficient real estate and security capital markets require strong public and private sector cooperation, disclosure of government and corporate financial conditions, and institutional individual investor confidence in both the financial and political institutions. If you do not have this, you will have uh, misallocation of resources, underproduction, underemployment, stagnant real wage growth, and declining social welfare and standards of living. That's basically what, what we're trying to measure. Uh, investing, particularly in, in, either in human capital, in your firm, in the stock market, in real estate, is a multidisciplinary um, uh, endeavor. You have to know a little bit or a lot about the accounting, about finance, about economics, about politics and law and how those laws are administered, and then basically the overall arching ideologies and philosophies and cultures that basically govern the society, and particularly in our, our case, it's a democratic capitalistic system. Uh, in the valuation equation, when you are trying to value a firm, value a piece of real estate, value a stock, it's usually the cash flows divided by whatever your expected rate of return is, is going to determine the value. You can also project out what the cash flows are in the future, discount them back by your expected rate of return. You can also get the intrinsic value that way. What I found out is that the cash flows from the firm, from the real estate, from the stocks are highly correlated to the business cycle. So really over the last 15 years, most of the volatility in the prices have come from the discount rate. Now the discount rate, the discount rate is uh, decomposed into the risk-free rate, which is the real rate plus inflation expectations, inflation risk, credit risk, illiquidity risk, maturity risk, currency, tax risk. And there are also two more variables that are extremely uh, influential in determining valuations these days, and that's political risk and policy risk. Uh, we are in a, a presidential election cycle right now, uh, after we uh, vote on the presidency and they are take office next year, um, the presidency, along with the two houses of Congress, will be negotiating policy and we will be impacted either directly or indirectly by those policy outcomes. 
So uh, historically, that's all you had to do was uh, accumulate a portfolio uh, of properties or stocks or bonds. Uh, and if the rates of return were non-correlated or were negatively correlated or had no correlation with each other, no relationship, you could add those assets to the portfolio. You would diversify away the uh, unsystematic risk. And the only thing that would be left is the systematic or the economic risk. Uh, when you're building the portfolios, either your, your, your company portfolio, your property portfolio, your stock, your bond portfolio, you want to be adding uh, assets to the portfolio with returns that are non-correlated. And what that does is it basically allows you to what is called bow out the efficient frontier. If you're adding assets whose returns are not related to each other, then it's going to reduce the overall risk of the portfolio. Yes, it's going to reduce the return, but the risk is going to be reduced even more, and that means your return to risk ratio is going to be higher, and you're going to be better off. Uh, using products such as uh, whole life insurance and guaranteed annuities and other types of guaranteed products actually bows out the efficient frontier, which is what you're trying to do, along with um, real estate in your portfolio will also do that. So here's an example portfolio that I put together for a client. We had 45% in bonds, 25% in stock, 10% in uh, cash value life insurance, 10% in direct real estate, and 10% in alternative energy. This is basically the bogey or the proxy portfolio that I see as being the defensive portfolio going forward over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, the reality is, is now because of asset price bubbles and crashes and political uncertainty and global stress, there's more systematic risk embedded in the economy now than ever before. So you have to be really, really, really smart in not only how you plan your business and operate it, but how you invest going forward. And do you have risk management strategies in place to be able to mitigate the economic damage or political damage that, be, that could be coming your way over the next three, five, 10 years? Uh, and here's where the risk is. You have more inflation risk, and you can just see how much more volatility there is now just in inflation. You also have more energy risk. You can see the volatility in just oil prices um, since 2000, more price risk. You can also see gold. Um, gold has, been, has run up significantly over the last 10 years and then has dropped significantly over the last two to three years. Again, just a lot more uh, asset price volatility now than ever before in history, and we need to be able to manage that. And then the last index is the called the VIX index. This shows stock market volatility. You could see how high the volatility was in between 2001 and 3, which was the last recession before the 08, 09 recession. Then we went into a, a low period of volatility, huge economic gains during that time period in economic growth and wealth effects. And then the 08, 09 uh, recession, which was the financial crisis, really changed the, the whole economic environment, making everything more volatile and harder to manage going forward. So let's talk about more macro risks that we are confronting now and how do you plan and how do you understand those things. Uh, the first is really let's put it into context. What have we come through over the last 10 years? And I wrote this after doing all of the research. Uh, over the last past 95 years, society and the economy have witnessed great prosperity, wars, depressions, recessions, and revolutions. We have just witnessed a revolution in political, economic, ideological thought, from Keynesianism to monetarism, and in its wake, institutional deconstruction, destruction, and market failure. The question will be, what social, political, and economic institutional synthesis will develop, and how will history judge us, and how will we be remembered? The financial crisis basically set off, from what I could see, is a dialectic. Um, these dialectics usually occur after institutions have been corrupted uh, in government and politics and the economy. They manifest into wars, and they set off a 30-year dialectic. There's been three 30-year dialectics prior to the financial crisis. And if the financial crisis set off a dialectic, 
we are in the first seven years of the first 15 years of the 30-year dialectic. There will be massive change institutionally and at the consumer and at the retail level and the institutional level going forward and we have to understand that and we have to plan for it. Uh, I think that um, Dwight D. Eisenhower probably put it the best on the undue influence uh, of certain sectors of the economy on, on government and how the reallocation really works. Eisenhower said in the councils of government we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. We now have a financial industrial complex, technology industrial complex, healthcare industrial complex, and prison industrial complex, and others that are all competing for influence in economics in the policy realm, and they have a direct impact on us. The potential for dis disastrous rise of misplaced power, power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or a democratic process. This is the environment in which we are looking at right now, and that was written in 1961. So you really have to look at the political process, and this is the public choice mean voter theorem that I derived, and you can see over time that there has been major political shifts to the right uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, and actually the last 30 years. Currently, the political process or the environment is extremely volatile between the two parties. It's winner take all. There's no consensus on policy that needs to be developed in the right of center sphere. And I just don't see it occurring for the next, I don't know when, but the reality is, is that the binary nature of politics currently is having an effect on policy. And those policies are having an effect on business and economics. So we have to understand the political process. Uh, the other risk out there are budget deficits. Currently, we run about an $18 trillion budget deficit. We're about a little over 100% debt to total GDP on an annual basis. Most of the debt that's been issued is controlled by foreign governments. So that could have a major influence on bond prices and interest rates going forward. So just the amount of debt and structural deficits that are being run by the federal government adds a systematic risk that we need to monitor and we need to plan for. Uh, regulation. After the financial crisis, Dodd-Frank was basically implemented. It laid out basically the regulatory environment to govern and to monitor financial institutions. This law is basically slowly being dismantled by Wall Street, and it, it's become obvious to me that we will probably be facing another financial crisis, hopefully not as severe as the 0809, by 2021 through 23. Could be earlier. But basically, Wall Street is continuing to do what they've always done, and that just adds more risk of a recession um, sooner than later. And again, we need to plan for that. Uh, this is the yield curve, which is basically interest rates by maturity by bonds. Basically, all stocks, all bonds, all companies, all real estate are priced off of this yield curve. And the yield curve moves up and down and inverts. So we have to monitor interest rates constantly. We need to monitor the yield curve. If you look at uh, what could be coming at us, and it probably will be coming, as the economy slows, the Fed does not have the uh, ability to basically continue to print money and buy bonds and drive interest rates low because they're already low. So now what they may be doing is printing more money in the future to stimulate the economy and actually drive interest rates negative. If interest rates go negative, it will distort the banking system, it will tax savers, and we will probably see disintermediation in the capital markets and in financial institutions. Again, more risk we got to plan for. Uh, the attractiveness and where a lot of investors have been looking to place their money is in real estate because the spreads between the rates of return on the real estate and the risk-free rates or interest rates, the spreads are wide, widening, and make real estate a very attractive asset class, which means there's massive amounts of capital moving into real estate currently, which could be creating, on the commercial side, an asset price bubble. Uh, interest rates, again, why isn't the economy growing? I mean, the uh, latest numbers that just came out is, is the Fed should be targeting uh, gross domestic product growth or economic growth at around 4%. Uh, 
they're getting zero and they're printing all this money and you're not really seeing inflation so why it's because the velocity of money is totally collapsed the velocity of money is the number of times currency basically circulates within the economy and as you can see from the graph this is the velocity of money calculation or the velocity of money measure and it's basically as low or lower than it was in 1960. So policy should be focused on labor and getting the velocity of money to work again and there's just institutional uh, problems. There's a lot of leakage in the economy so the Fed can, they can print all this money and not even stimulate the economy because that, all that money shoots out overseas into the global markets and it's gone. Does not have the accelerator, does not have a multiplier, does not have a stimulative effect anymore. So we're basically run out of monetary bullets. Again, we got to start thinking defensively, not only from an investment standpoint, but from a risk management standpoint. Uh, quantitative easing. The Fed has basically printed $5 trillion worth of money to basically bail out the banking system, to buy bonds, drive bond prices up, and drive interest rates down. Uh, we started out at about a uh, trillion dollars, now we're at five. Can it go to 10 trillion? God, I hope not. But again, these monetary policy risks are something we have to anticipate and we have to be, uh, uh, be thinking, uh, where are we going to put our money and how are we going to defend it? Uh, the business cycle, probably the most important thing from this presentation will be the discussion on the business cycle. The business cycle, from my calculations, uh, historically have been very short and brief. The average recession lasts around, lasts around two years. So they're V-shaped or U-shaped. The last recession has been L-shaped. So unless you've lived in and around the top 10 metro areas in the United States, you basically have been stagnant for the last seven years. So really what that tells us is there's a lot of places around the United States that are basically stagnant or declining, and the only places that seem to be thriving are submarkets, primary submarkets within primary metro areas across the United States, and those are only about 10. The other thing that was uh, really interesting about uh, the research, as you can see, is gross domestic product decline in the 08-09 recession was twice as, went down twice as much as any other recession since 1940. This was a man-made recession, but it was extremely severe. It took us a long time to get out of it. And from my view, there's a lot of the same elements that led up to that recession are still in place. Again, we gotta be thinking, planning, business, personal, um, investment, and risk management. What I found out that was really interesting too is I went back to 1940, and I hacked up the decades into 10-year increments and then bisected them into five-year increments. And then I coded all the recessions and all the growth periods. And from my calculation, there is a 90% probability of a recession or recessions in the first five years of every single decade. And you will be in the growth peak phase 70% uh, of the time in the last five years of every decade, which means that there is a higher probability of a recession in 2018 and we will definitely be in a recession in 2021 through 23, and that's not that far off. So we have to start planning right now. Uh, next thing. Um, oh, I already went through that, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, economic indicators. What economic indicators should you be looking at? Uh, first is unemployment. Uh, unemployment in the United States is at an all-time low. It's basically at 5%, which is considered full employment, and it's even lower in the Bay Area. However, there's more people underemployed now, so you have to double the unemployment rate to really get a, f a real feel for what the stresses on the labor markets are. So if the unemployment rate is 5%, the underemployment rate is 10%. And labor participation rates are at their all-time low, at a time period where women are fully participating in the labor force. So it's in the labor markets. The problem with the underperformance in the economy is we don't have enough people working. There needs to be policy in labor policy. Jobs. 
jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs basically drive everything. And if you look at the job growth in the Bay Area over the last two years, we've generated over 100,000 jobs per year over the last two years. I don't see anything disrupting that just yet. Um, it hasn't been confirmed, but I have a feeling that I've seen some job layoffs start to uh, be mentioned, uh, particularly at Twitter and some of the tech companies. So it looks like job growth is starting to decelerate. The question is, is it just a maturing of the, of the employment cycle or will there be some kind of exogenous or external shock that will decelerate the job growth? If we start to see it in job growth, then yes, uh, we will probably be falling into a recession within the next maybe a couple of years, but definitely the next five years. So I watch the, watch the labor market, watch unemployment rates. Uh, when you're looking at areas to invest in, either corporate bonds or stocks or real estate um, for your own personal portfolio or your business, you want to look at where the sectors are actually concentrated, the, the industry sectors, such as uh, high tech and biotech, alternative energy, healthcare, uh, financial services, telecom, multimedia, internet, uh, international trade, education, defense, agriculture. Um, what I do is I look at the geography, I look at the industry, I look at the firms that are clustering there, and I ask myself, are the firms growing or contracting? If they're growing and they have a good long-term prospect, I'm going to buy the bonds, I'm going to buy the stocks, I'm going to buy the real estate, or I'm going to locate in those areas. So the economic base as a strategy for diversification is extremely valuable. International trade. We are a global economy right now. Um, it is really important to understand that we here on the West Coast, particularly in San Francisco, LA, and Seattle, are facing some of the fastest growing economies in the world. It's the mo most dynamic region. It's the Pan-Pacific region. We are basically in the epicenter of this Pan-Pacific region with high velocity of trade and human capital and capital that I do not see being disrupted over the long run, at least the next 10, 20, 30 years. I would rather be here than on the East Coast facing Europe, Africa, and Latin America. Strategies also um, for investment purposes is to look at the arterials that are emanating from these transportation hubs. This graph basically shows you the economic impact from the ports of LA and Long Beach across the United States. So major trade centers, major trade hubs, and the arterials that, that basically emanate out from them have the highest land use density, have the most profitable firms, the most productive employees. <clears throat> so as a strategy for location and investment, you want to be investing in firms and in land along these arterials. Technology and venture capital. This is extremely important to be uh, looking at too because obviously if you're going to be raising capital either through seed or angel or round A, B, C, D plus B, C and then go IPO, um, it's going to be really important to understand the trends in venture capital and in technology. California is a dominant technology state um, and some of the statistics that I've seen we capture roughly 70% of all risk-based capital in the United States. So California, in my view, is the best. Uh, Non-residential fixed investment, that's been recovering. And you're seeing investment in technology, in technology firms. That's positive. Uh, semiconductor sales continue to be positive on a global basis, affects Silicon Valley positively. Venture capital flows, this is the most important. Over the last three quarters, except for the last quarter, over the last three quarters, the total amount of venture capital raised in the United States was between 10 and $13 billion. And Silicon Valley was capturing between 50 and 60% of that capital, and California was capturing up to 70%. However, in the last quarter, venture capital, both quarter to quarter and year over year, has dropped 46%. If venture capital flows are a leading indicator or the canary in the coal mine in regards to the tech sector and investment, then we are on the downturn. It will be interesting to see if these venture capital flows recover, but they were at such a high rate for such a long time that I think we've now probably seen the peak in the technology bubble. Uh, and where did the money go? It went into software, biotech, 
consumer products and services, media entertainment, IT services, uh, uh, energy, uh, financial services, and obviously software got the biggest, which is basically application programming. Uh, economic geography. What are the economic advantages by geography? California is basically has some of the highest concentration of human and physical capital in the United States. Uh, Northern California is tech dominated. Southern California is trade and entertainment dominated. You really don't have to go outside California to get diversification effects uh, by investing in firms in Northern and Southern California by investing in real estate in Northern and Southern California, you can get the diversification effects in California without even having to go outside California. And the only reason why you would go outside California is because the taxes are so high here. You would arbitrage your human capital by having satellites or investing your capital in, in areas bordering California in the desert and mountain states and don't go any further east. Uh, San Francisco, LA are now the two top markets for real estate investment in the world. We are now global. There's massive amounts of foreign capital coming in. I don't see that changing unless something um, drastic changes. But we are now on the map and there's massive capital flows coming into uh, San Francisco and LA. And you're seeing it in the, in the pricing. And if you look at the metro areas, in the western region, they dominate all the property sectors. The Desert Mountain California metros rank high in apartments, industrial, office, and retail. So we are in the best markets here in, the, in California, the Desert Mountain states. You don't have to go any further. And if you look at performance, uh, rent growth has been highest in San Jose, obviously New York, Pacific Northwest, San Diego, yes, Texas, Austin, Dallas, and then San Francisco, Bellevue, East Bay. So you can see where the majority of the job growth, productivity, investment returns are coming from in those dominant markets, and we rank in the highest. And then if you're looking for investments uh, to invest in commercial real estate, um, it's at the submarket level. You have to look at the submarket level. Um, and what I did was I built a model that basically looked at the scores of these submarkets by survey score and quantitative score, and then plot, plot the submarkets. And this is just the San Francisco uh, Bay Area plots. And you can see Mountain View, Los Altos, very high central San Mateo, Sunnyvale, Walnut Creek, Fremont Union City. So these are the top markets in the Bay Area for location, for investment. Then I basically did a map and you can really see the geographic areas that are really the primary areas for investment. East Bay Pocket, uh, Lafayette Arinda, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo Peninsula, and then West uh, uh, Santa Clara County where Palo Alto, Stanford, Sunnyvale, Mountain View are located where the bulk of the headquarter uh, Silicon Valley headquarters are located. That's where you want to be. So to conclude here, I just want to wrap it up with some uh, concluding remarks. First, the global economy is growing, but it's slowing. The focus is on Asia. The emerging markets are under distress and Latin American economies are under distress too. Retail sales and consumer confidence still remain relatively high, but are starting to slow. Large multinational corporations have three to five trillion dollars in cash, most of it overseas, looking to deploy back into the United States or to be able to keep overseas to be able to reinvest. We still can continue to see, uh, and we will still continue to see, rising import-export trade growth for the foreseeable future. The risks that we run here is deflation and disinflation, uh, oil and gas, price volatility, interest rate volatility, sovereign de bond defaults, those are gonna be coming in the next five years. Uh, uncertainty for business and consumer confidence, you're seeing businesses start to be a little concerned. Middle East unrest, uh, Eastern European and, and Russian uh, volatility, uh, Japan uh, 
may or may not default, probably will not, but we do not know what's on the Japanese and the, and the Chinese balance sheets in regards to their banking system, which is a big risk. And rising costs of living in food and housing and healthcare and education and utilities and, and rising taxes are one of the biggest concerns going forward. You already saw high and rising taxes in 2013 in capital gains, Obamacare and personal income taxes and corporate income taxes are, are coming next. So we're looking at a basically a very risky tax environment coming in once the elections are over. And lastly, um, financial industry and institutional consolidation. We're now starting to hear about layoffs from a lot of the major banks. Uh, uh, the banks failed their stress tests, which means a lot of their balance sheets and what they were doing operationally are still intact from the financial crisis, which makes the system extremely fragile. And that's why I'm sticking to my guns and saying we will see a mid-cycle correction by 2018 and we will see another potentially severe recession between 21 and 23 and we start to have to start planning, investing, and putting together risk management strategies to take that into consideration. So I'm going to end it there and I'll take any questions uh, or any comments.